Well, it's wonderful to be here, and I really am grateful for all of you coming out tonight. It's not maybe the best night uh, in terms of the weather, but uh, you're all here, and that's just wonderful. I am not a stranger to Steamboat, as a matter of fact, because we have very dear friends. Some of you may know Rick and Carol Dowden, and we've stayed with them many times. And I've skied your mountain, and I have fished the Yampa uh, without any success, I might say. <laughs> Of course, it's, it's called fishing, it's not called catching, I'm told. And uh, it's just being in the river that's fun. But tonight I'm going to talk about something I think is extremely important. It's this book, Hidden in Plain Sight, and the subtitle is What Caused the World's Worst Financial Crisis and Why It Could Happen Again. And I'll try to get to all of those subjects as I talk through um, what the book is about. I was so delighted to hear Jennifer a quote from um, the book uh, about Milton Friedman and what Milton Friedman had done and said and so forth. Um, and I, I, to me, this is very important, and I, I, I quote Milton Friedman in the book a couple of times. But what was important about Milton Friedman for me is that when we came out of the Great Depression, and I'm looking around, none of you was in the Great Depression, but when we came out of the Great Depression, the thought was that competition was the problem. Um, there were many bills and laws passed during the Depression that attempted to eliminate or reduce competition through regulation. And the notion was that people were actually um, unemployed because there was so much competition it drove down prices and businesses failed. Milton Friedman, as most of you, probably all of you know, wrote a very famous book with Anna Schwartz in the 60s. And what they argued is that there was really nothing about the depression that was unusual except for the monetary policy of the Federal Reserve. It was too tight. And that caused the financial crisis. Now, what was important about this is that once people thought about this a little bit and said, well, wait a minute, if competition wasn't the source of the problem in the Depression, well, then we should have more competition, shouldn't we? Because it, it promotes innovation and it promotes lower prices and it puts more people to work and so forth. It's not a problem, it's a solution. And so, an, what was essentially an academic idea, a new way of describing something serious like the Depression, really changed policy in the United States. And in the 70s, and 1970s, 1980s, we started to eliminate a lot of the regulation that had restricted the American economy, and we had a much um, more uh, vigorous economy. So, this all leads to why I'm here tonight to talk about this book. Because this book is about what caused the financial crisis. And if we continue to believe that the cause of the financial crisis is what the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission said, and what you read in the newspapers every day, or you see on television, and that is that it was the banks and the private sector and their lack of regulation and their greed and their risk-taking that caused the financial crisis, well then, of course, we're going to have a lot of restrictive regulation that would stop that from happening again. And that's exactly what happened. We passed, in 2010, something called the Dodd-Frank Act, and if many of you are bankers or in the financial business, you certainly know what that is. And that law is so restrictive that it has caused the very slow recovery that we have had from the financial crisis and the recession that followed. And in fact, the recovery we have had is by far, it's not even close, by far the slowest recovery from a financial crisis or a, or a recession this country has seen since the 1960s. So what I'm saying really is that what we understand about the past reflects what we do in the future. And the whole purpose of this book is to try to make it clear to people that we should understand the financial crisis in a different way from the way 
We are being told to understand it by our government and by the media. So we ought to understand it as something that was actually created by the government. And what I will try to explain to you, as the book does, is what is in this book and why the government had such a major role in the causing of this crisis. Now we all know that the crisis was a result of what was called a mortgage meltdown. Um, but hardly anyone goes behind that and tries to find out what that really means. Why were there so many very poor quality mortgages in the market? Uh, why were they made? It seems strange that you would make poor quality mortgages. And finally, why did they cause a financial crisis? And that's what I'm going to try to explain tonight if I can. Um, as as uh, Jennifer and Rick described, I was part of this Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. I dissented from the report because the report, I thought, was designed to pro provide a foundation for Congress to pass the Dodd-Frank Act um, because it blamed the financial crisis on the private sector and left the government's role completely out of consideration. While I was a member, I tried very hard to get the commission to think about other ideas, to uh, research some of these questions, but they would have, the majority of the commission would have nothing to do with it. There were six Democrats and there were four Republicans on the commission. I was one of, one of the Republicans and it was, the commission was just created for the purpose of making sure a foundation was laid for some very strong regulation um, after the commission reported. Ironically, in the end, Congress adopted the Dodd-Frank Act, this very restrictive legislation, before the committee even reported. So they weren't really worried at that point about whether they were going to have the facts. Um, they knew what the facts were as the commission was going to report them, so they thought they could adopt the law well in advance. But this has become the conventional narrative for the financial crisis. And you hear it all the time on the media, you hear it from our government officials daily when they talk about this, and I'm going to try to contradict those views. The facts, to me, tell a completely different story. And the one fact I'm going to try to explain, if I can, or, or put before you, is can I have slide one um, back there? Can we put that up? Okay. Um, this is the central fact, and that is before, before the financial crisis in 2008, if you can see that from out there, before the crisis in, uh, in 2008, um, a majority of all mortgages in our financial system were subprime or otherwise very weak mortgages. Of those, and that, that was 31 million mortgages, out of the 55 million mortgages we had in the country at the time. 31 million were subprime or very low quality. Of those, 76% were on the books of government agencies. That shows you who created the demand for those mortgages. And I'm going to try to explain why it was that the government created that, how the, how that the government policies demanded the creation of those mortgages. But these are the numbers up there. And you can see that about 23.8 million out of the 31 million were on the books of government agencies. And then there were another seven and a, and a half million, I'll do the math, that's about 24% was on the books of the private sector. So just looking at that number alone, you would have to believe that the government's role in creating the financial crisis was much larger than the private sector's role. Now this is, not a not, this is not a partisan story because the policies that created the crisis, in my view, began in the Clinton administration but continued all the way through the Bush administration until 2008. So it was errors by the government in both parties. And so I'm, I want to be sure that we understand that we're talking about the right policies for the government, not a particular party's errors. Um, now why should we be concerned about the financial crisis at this point? And this is one of the things that I confront all the time 
when I talk about the book or I talk to people that I meet and I say, I've been writing a book about the financial crisis, it's out, here's the book, and they say things like, well, wait a minute, it's, it's a long time, it's what is it, six years. All right, that's all over. Why should we be worried about the financial crisis? That's why I talked about Milton Friedman at the beginning, because it shows you that if you understand what actually happened at a point in the past, then it affects the way you act in the future. And if we're following the wrong ideas for what caused the financial crisis, we're going to adopt the wrong policies. And so, we did. The Dodd-Frank Act, as I explained at the very beginning, mentioned at the very beginning, is such a repressive uh, regulation of the financial system that it has caused a very slow uh, recovery from our uh, recession. And that means much less employment than we should have. That means the government has much fewer revenues, much smaller revenues, because there are fewer people working. All of this was very, was a, a result of the policies we adopted because of the way the financial crisis was diagnosed by the people who were in power at the time. Also, if we don't understand why we had the crisis, we'll do the same thing again. And that's why the subtitle of the book says, uh, if we, it, what caused the world's financial crisis and why it could happen again. It could happen again if we then look at the financial crisis as solely a private sector issue and we allow the government to continue to do everything that it did before. And in fact, as I will explain at the, at the very end, I hope, if I have time, um, we are doing it. The same thing, again. Our government is doing exactly the same thing now that it did before the financial crisis. And why? Because the American people don't know that there's a relationship between the, what the government policies were and the crisis that we had in 2008. If the American people were familiar with this and understood this, then there would be an outcry if the government was doing the same thing again. But you don't hear an outcry. And that's, that's important. And unless we understand all of this, the result is going to be we'll follow the same policies and m maybe it'll take 10 years or 15 years or whatever time it will take, it will be another financial crisis for this country. In addition, those who the government has helped in the past uh, to buy homes, and I'll explain why the government was helping them and how the government was helping them, those people are, turn out to be the victims um, because they're the ones who, when the cycle turns and we are no longer in a boom era with mortgages, they're the ones who get evicted. And it's not only that, and this is important for everyone to understand, when your neighbor defaults on his car loan, that has no effect on you. You might have to drive him to work, I understand, but, but it doesn't have a direct effect on your financial condition. If he defaults on his mortgage, that has a direct effect on you, as you all know, because when homes in that neighborhood are then appraised for refinancing or, or, pay, or appraised before, because they're going to be sold or for any other reason, all those houses have been driven down in value because there is at least one house in the neighborhood that has, uh, on which the mortgage has been defaulted, there's been an eviction, a foreclosure, and the institution that is holding that mortgage is willing to take any price for that house. Um, and so all home prices are then looked at as much lower than they were just before that occurred. So every American should be interested, every American homeowner should be interested in making sure that all the houses are owned by people who can meet fundamental underwriting standards, which are tests of ways they are going to be able to continue to meet their obligations on their mortgages in the future. So what happened? How did it happen? Before 1992, Two government-backed firms that you've probably heard about but didn't quite understand, um, named Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, were the dominant players in the housing market. 
Uh, Fannie and Freddie did not make loans themselves. They bought loans from those that did make the loans. They would buy mortgages from banks and other lenders. It was a good policy, actually, to have people who, uh, organizations that would do that, uh, because that provided more liquidity to the lenders. The lenders then could go out and make more mortgages. But the significant thing about Fannie and Freddie, aside from the part that they were backed by the government, which is important, backed by and regulated by the government, they um, would only buy a certain kind of mortgage. They would only buy a prime mortgage. And a prime mortgage was defined as a mortgage to a borrower who had a good credit score. Um, it, today we use something called a FICO score that was made up by a group uh, called Fair Isaac. It's called the FICO score. It's almost universally used to measure people's propensity to meet their obligations. And the people who had good FICO scores, 660 or more, were considered to be good borrowers. Together with the FICO score was a down payment. Fannie and Freddie demanded a 10 to 20% down payment. And finally, a debt to income ratio of no more than 38%. That meant that after the mortgage was closed, you look at all your debts, you look at what your income is, including the mortgage, of course, and the debts were no more than 38% of your total income. That was considered a prime mortgage. And in normal times, a prime mortgage had a default rate of about 1%. Um, however, in 1992, Congress adopted a new set of rules for how Fannie and Freddie would conduct their business, called the Affordable Housing Goals. The Affordable Housing Goals said, for all mortgages that you buy, Fannie and Freddie, 30% have to be made to people who are at or below the median income in the places where they live. Um, actually, that was not a very tough standard because if they simply opened the doors and the mortgages flowed in, which is really what happened, uh, people made mortgages and then sold them to Fannie and Freddie, the mortgages that came in, probably 30% of them would be prime mortgages. Um, however, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and now we get to the government's role. The Department of Housing and Urban Development um, was given the authority to adjust these standards. Could we have the next slide? And the one after this, the next one. There. Can you see it? OK, well, then I'll explain it to you. Um, it isn't really very clear, is it? But what you, what you see is that from 1996 to the year 2008, there was an increase in the top line that's shaded there. From about 40%, it, it moved from 30% to 40% in 1996, and then all the way to the end, it went to 56% by 2008. And it was in, in 2000, at the end of the, of the Clinton administration, it was uh, about 50%. So, in other words, Fannie and Freddie, when they bought mortgages, now had to find at least 50, and by 2008, at least 56% of all the mortgages they found had to be made to people who were below the median income. And there were other standards below that that you, I won't even describe to you, but they referred to people who had 80% of the median income or 60% of the median income or were underserved parties, which meant they were in minority, poor minority districts. So all of these standards had to be met by Fannie and Freddie just to, just to do business. Now, um, when your underwriting standards are reduced, uh, well, let me put it this way. When you have to buy mortgages from people who don't have good credit scores and don't have down payments and may have a uh, great deal of difficulty with very high um, uh, obligations, uh, loans from others, um, these, are, these reflect uh, these are not prime mortgages. These are non-prime mortgages. And what Fannie and Freddie had to do in order to comply with these growing requirements was to reduce their underwriting standards over time. So that by 1995, they were accepting mortgages with a 3% down payment. Remember, in 1992, 
They wouldn't take a mortgage with less than a 10% down payment. By 1995, they were accepting mortgages with 3% down payments. And by the year 2000, they were accepting mortgages with no down payments. So you can see what happens when underwriting standards are reduced um, by Fannie and Freddie, or when they have to meet these quotas, they will have to reduce their underwriting standards. Now, what happens when you reduce underwriting standards is that uh, you create much more demand for mortgages because more people, and more, for homes too, mortgages and homes, more people are able to buy homes when these standards are reduced. And so, can we have the next slide, please? Hello. Next slide. There it is. This is what happens when underwriting standards are reduced. This was a housing price bubble. Now, you've probably all experienced this. You've been homeowners during the period of the bubble, and you remember how housing prices increased about 10% a year. It was just incredible what was happening. This, is, uh, these, this data is from Robert Schiller, who's a professor at Yale. And you can see this huge run-up, the largest bubble we ever had, and then this tremendous decline in 2007 and 2008. Um, why would you have a bubble like this? Well, economists will give you many reasons. And one certainly is the Fed's monetary policy. Any of you who are economists will say the Fed's monetary policy was important at this, in this case. But I want to just talk about some practical things. If you want to buy a $100,000 home and the down payment is 10% and you have $10,000, you can buy a $100,000 home. But if they cut the underwriting standard to 5%, you can then buy a $200,000 home. Two things have happened. First of all, you've got more money chasing fewer homes, in a sense, driving up housing prices. It's one of the reasons for the bubble. But there's another event, and that is the person who would have had a $90,000 loan now has a $190,000 loan. A much more, a much riskier borrower, one who is less able in when the cycle turns, when things get bad, uh, to sustain a, a mortgage, to carry a mortgage. And that affects, as I indicated, all homeowners. Well, this bubble eventually came to a halt in 2007. And as you can see, prices fell precipitously. Um, this had an effect on the private sector as well as the government. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac immediately became insolvent. And they were taken over by the government. They are still controlled by the government by their regulator, um, and, but they are still functioning. And you, the taxpayers, have been furnishing money to them so they can continue to operate. The total, their total losses were probably something like $265 billion. And the taxpayers have made up that, those losses so they can continue to function and keep the mortgage market functioning because without them, the mortgage market wouldn't function. So that's one kind of loss we had. And, FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, another government agency, also suffered huge losses. It was bailed out uh, to about the extent of about $1.3 billion in, in September of 2013. I suppose you never even heard about that one. But that is, that is typically what happens. The government has suffered big losses because the government had actually bought many of these mortgages. But the private sector uh, s suffered losses too. And the reason the private sector suffered losses is that many of these losses were bundled into what were called mortgage-backed securities. And the way this works is that maybe 10,000 mortgages are put together into a pool, and then the principal and interest that is paid into the pool by the people who um, had uh, taken out those mortgages that principle and interest is paid out to investors who have bought securities, which are interests in the pool. Many, many private sector institutions did that. It, was, it made a lot of sense for them to do it because capital requirements for banks, in particular, favored their owning 
these mortgage-backed securities instead of owning the mortgages themselves. So many, many banks and other financial institutions bought these mortgage-backed securities. At the same time, there were changes in accounting standards. Now I know no one wants to hear about accounting standards, except uh, some of you who might be accountants, but um, the accounting standards are extremely important. And the accounting standards at the time said that if you owned a security, any security, not just a mortgage-backed security, any security, you had to carry that mortgage on your balance sheet at the market value. Can I see the next slide, please? This is a chart that this I think you can see wherever you're sitting. This is a chart of the mortgage-backed securities business. And you can see what happened in 2007. There was this huge decline as these defaults started to come in and were made public. An unprecedented, unprecedented number of defaults, whether they were in mortgage-backed securities or not, the, the number of defaults was becoming known. And what happened was that investors in mortgage-backed securities fled the market. They weren't there anymore. So the market just fell. The, the value of mortgage-backed securities declined substantially to almost nothing. And banks and other financial institutions then had to write down those instruments on their balance sheets, causing them to look very weak and possibly insolvent. So that's when you remember in 2007 and early 2008 about the panic that was in the market and the, and the headlines in the newspapers and in Bloomberg and so forth about all the failures that were going on. This was the result of this huge decline in the value of mortgage-backed securities because there were no buyers. Doesn't necessarily mean that people who were holding these, the people who had the mortgages, that is, who had to meet the mortgage obligations, were not still paying principal and interest. In many cases, they still were. But there were no buyers for the securities, and so the securities fell in value even though they were flowing cash. So that's another factor you have to remember about this crisis. It was caused in large part by this very strange, these very odd, um, accounting rules. Um, so how did this lead then to a financial crisis? Everyone was very worried about the condition of financial institutions. And uh, in March of 2009, a, a rather large investment bank by the name of Burns was required, um, was losing Investors, people were running from Bear Stearns because Bear Stearns was very heavily invested in the mortgage market. And the government then had to make a decision. Should we let Bear Stearns fail or should we bail them out? And this was a fateful choice in my view. Um, Bear Stearns, the decision was made by the Bush administration to bail out Bear Stearns. I think this was a a major error, uh, as, and I think later events showed what a serious error it was. Uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, was very worried that if Bear Stearns was allowed to fail, it would pull down the entire market in a huge crash. All other institutions would fail because they were kind of all interconnected with Bear Stearns. So they rescued Bear Stearns. That reassured the market for a while, and for six months, nothing serious happened. But then, Lehman Brothers, another Wall Street bank, uh, investment bank, not a commercial bank, not insured by the government, um, got into serious trouble. And most people in the market had thought that because the government rescued Bear Stearns, they would also be rescuing Lehman Brothers, because Lehman Brothers was 50% larger than Bear Stearns. But at that point, the government changed its policy completely, reversed its policy, Lehman Brothers was allowed to fail, and we remember the, the chaos that occurred after that. But there was one thing significant about that chaos, and that is that no other large financial institution of any kind failed 
because of its exposure to Lehman Brothers. And that tells us that there isn't this interconnection between these big financial institutions that Paulson was afraid of. In other words, if he had allowed Bear Stearns to fail, that wouldn't have been such a big problem. A Bear Stearns would not have caused the rest of the market to collapse because Lehman Brothers didn't cause other financial institutions to fail, and Lehman Brothers was even larger and failed suddenly in the middle of a very anxious market. Caused a lot of chaos, but it didn't pull anyone down. What did happen, though, is that investors were so frightened by the fact that the government had reversed its policies and the fact that the, the uh, other firms had not uh, taken in much more equity to support their, the creditors that they already had. They were convinced that the government was going to rescue them, so they didn't think that they really had to uh, dilute their shareholders any further by selling equity between the time that Bear Stearns failed and the time that Lehman Brothers failed. Um, that meant that all the, the institutions in the market were really very short of equity and were, they were weak. They were weak in that sense, weak in terms of capital. But even though they didn't fail after Lehman, when the government changed its policies, people looked at these institutions and said, we don't know who's gonna fail next, we're getting out. And so every uh, financial institution of any size at that point had to make sure it had enough capital and had enough cash to pay people who came to them and said, I want my money back. And that meant something happened that, nothing, that no one had ever seen before. Banks refused to lend to one another, even overnight. That had never happened, at least in the memory of people in the market at the time, in the memory of academics, in the memory of regulators. No one ever remembered a time when the banks refused to lend to one another overnight. And that is what really caused people to believe we had a, 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 a financial crisis that was unprecedented in size and danger. So I've told you now how it occurred. It occurred because the government forced Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to reduce their underwriting standards. They did that. They filled the market with low quality mortgages and subprime mortgages. They helped build a huge bubble. When the bubble collapsed, many private financial institutions lost huge amounts of money. And, and then the accounting standards and the rescue of Bear Stearns and then the failure to rescue uh, Lehman Brothers all brought everything crashing down in September of 2008. So it wasn't, it wasn't in any sense a, a crisis caused by lack of regulation or uh, too much risk taking by the private sector. It was caused by the government's own activities. Why it can happen again? Just a couple of sentences on that. As long as we blame the private sector and we say that was the cause of the crisis, we are not going to pay any attention to what the government is doing. And we have not been paying attention to what the government is doing. And as I said before, right now the government is doing exactly the same thing. Only a few weeks ago, the president said that he would like to see the Federal Housing Administration reduce its insurance premiums for um, insuring mortgages. And when the FHA buys mortgages, they buy very weak mortgages but they usually charge stiff insurance premiums to protect themselves against the losses they're ultimately going to suffer. But since we're lowering the insurance premiums, they're going to suffer more losses. You as taxpayers are going to have to pay more to bail them out. And there will be many more people in the market owning homes who are not going to be able to meet their mortgage obligations. So we're starting the whole process all over again and if we just let it go the way it's going, we're going to have a financial crisis of the same kind years out, 10 years, 15 years, but it will happen. So that's why I'm here. I want to tell all of you about why it's important to understand what caused the financial crisis and what you as citizens can do to prevent it from happening again by making sure that your friends and colleagues and coworkers and others understand the stakes that are 
uh, there for all of us Americans. And remember that if we only blame the private sector for what happened in the crisis and not what the government is doing, we're going to end up in the same place several years from now. So thank you very much for your attention. Are, are you good to take a few questions? Sure. Um, before we take any questions, I want to remind you, when you go back, if you've not already bought a book, buy your book and then get in line to have Peter sign it and that'll, that'll keep it moving. All right, do we have some questions? Just raise your hand and... Thank you very much, Peter. Do you think that the current accommodative Fed uh, policy might also be something that is uh, working to move us in the same direction you talked about? It could be. I'm not a specialist in that. I was, fortunately, you all know I'm a lawyer and not an economist. But um, I, I think the, a very accommodative Fed policy is one of the things that built the, the bubble. I don't think it was the only thing. Economists tend to think it was the only thing that built the bubble. And I think in, they, they like that idea because there's a lot of data that will support that idea. There's not as much data that supports the notion of low quality mortgages building the bubble, but I think my book makes the case that the low quality mortgages actually were much more likely to have built the bubble. So I'm not as worried about what the Fed has done. I don't know how they're going to get out of this situation. Uh, I'm not sure they know how they're going to get out of this situation, but as long as the Dodd-Frank Act is keeping the economy from growing the way it would normally grow in recovering from a recession, the Fed doesn't have to worry about inflation. Um, but this isn't the way it ought to work, is it? I didn't think so. So we're going to have to have a different set of policies. You mentioned a couple of times that you consider the Dodd-Frank legislation to have caused the slow recovery. How exactly did the Dodd-Frank legislation do that? Well, that's, that's what I was just saying is, is the problem, and that is that we, there's, there isn't a way for economists and people who study regulation to directly, directly connect with data um, the, what, what the regulations are doing and what is happening in the real economy. Um, but I think all of you know that regulation imposes huge costs on businesses. No matter what your business is, whether you're subject to the EPA or OSHA or if you're in the financial business and you're subject to the Dodd-Frank Act, it has had some effect on whether lenders will provide credit uh, without the so many restrictions and, and constraints and without so much work in trying to convince a lender to provide the credit that it does discourage people from starting businesses. And when, when fewer businesses are started, fewer people are employed. And these smaller businesses are the ones that eventually grow into the major businesses in our economy. So we have had a slow recovery because the, the I think, regulation has repressed uh, the kind of risk taking that always occurred in the financial system. There are other technical issues. Banks, for example, have to have more credit, have to have more capital. And to the extent that you have to have more capital, there are two ways to do that. You can sell shares or you can stop lending because capital is only a percentage of your outstanding liabilities. So if you reduce your liabilities by letting your loans run off and not making any new ones, your capital will rise. And that, of course, would have a very direct effect on, on um, the private sector. So those are some of the ways. But Alan Greenspan, who uh, is, I think, one of our more brilliant economists, has tried to focus on something he calls animal spirits. And that's why it's so difficult to point to any one thing and say, this has caused the slowdown. Um, what he is saying basically by animal spirits is that people get excited about starting businesses and, and working to create something new and to the extent that hindrances are put in the way, obstacles are put in the way, it dulls their spirit and they're not moving as quickly and they stop trying. And that's what I think we're seeing a lot in our economy and it's because, I think, of the tremendous amount of new regulation that came through the Dodd-Frank Act.
What did Countrywide do that got uh, its chairman Mozilla in so much trouble? And what? He got in, you know, Anthony Mozilla was chairman of Countrywide. Right. Uh, he's uh, facing criminal charges, I guess. I guess they haven't charged him with anything, but the media keeps talking about it. But what did they actually do that got him in that personal trouble? Um, Countrywide, and, uh, Countrywide was a subprime lender in the 1980s and up into the, nine, into the early 1990s. Subprime loans at that time were a niche market. About 10% of the market was subprime loans. And the ones that were in that business knew how to deal with subprime loans. There were very special ways that you ran your business if you were a subprime lender because you were taking a lot more risk. Fannie and Freddie started to buy subprime loans. Angelo Mazzillo, the head of Countrywide, realized that they didn't really care about the quality of the mortgages they were buying because they had to meet these government quotas. So he became the biggest suppliers to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And the mortgages that he was supplying were terrible mortgages. But from Fannie and Freddie's point of view, um, they were absolutely essential to meet these affordable housing requirements. And as a result, Andrew uh, uh, Mazzillo became a very wealthy man. Countrywide became one of the largest lenders in the United States. And it was all because Fannie and Freddie were the major customers, and they were, of course, the biggest buyers in the market. So what he did specifically, and whether he would actually be charged with a criminal um, charge of some kind, I'm not sure that the, they will actually ever charge him, but it is known that what he did was supply a lot of very poor quality mortgages to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, to government-backed entities that cost, cost the government a lot of money. Um, but the question really is, why did Fannie and Freddie buy them? And, and we now know that Fa Fannie and Freddie bought them because Congress and the, and the Department of Housing and Urban Development was insisting that they buy these mortgages. So that's, that's, the, that's the story, and it's a, it's a great example of what happens when the government interposes political standards or even social policies on what should be an economic activity. And so the government elides the whole question of whether a mortgage is a good quality mortgage, they don't care. What they want is to make sure that many people who couldn't get mortgages because they were low income had the opportunity to buy a home. Nice idea, but it's not good for the rest of the economy. Any other Got a questions? dovetail into that? Can't see. Right, right over here. Peter. Peter. Over there. Got a dovetail into that. Do you feel that uh, B of A was under the gun to buy country, countrywide? Because, I mean, it just seemed like if I could figure that out, surely B of A could have. <laughs> well, they're, it's hard to know what was going through their heads. But Countrywide was a very impressive company. I'm sorry? Is it, can you hear me? Countrywide was a very impressive com company um, up until the time it was acquired by Bank of America. Uh, it, w it had thrown off an awful lot of profits. It had grown tremendously over time. And there was a, something else operating in 2008 that many of you might remember but was significant, and that is that people didn't understand how many subprime mortgages there were in the market. When I showed you that chart, showed 16 and a half million subprime and other low quality mortgages held by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac never told anyone that they were buying those mortgages. No one knew that except the people at Fannie and Freddie. So many people had no idea how many poor quality mortgages were in the market. And if you looked at it from that point of view, and undoubtedly B of A did, they thought, well, how many bad mortgages could Countrywide have been collecting? And the answer was they were collecting many, many more than anyone ever imagined um, they had. So they, it, if, if I were a lawyer representing B of A, I would have probably spent 
six months in countrywide looking through their mortgage properties and would have been able to tell B of A that this didn't look all that good. Um, but uh, this looked to B of A as though it was a great deal. They were going to buy a, a company that was one of the largest mortgage companies in the United States, had, had, had profits for many, many years. They didn't realize what was under those balance sheets and income statements. They didn't do enough due diligence, that's, that's for sure. I think we have another one back here, Peter. I can't see where it is, but wave. Oh, okay, got it. I guess you need a little uh, disagreement here. Um, first of all, I've spent my entire career as a mortgage lender and also was on the board of a very large private mortgage insurance company. And the facts that I've seen really don't, well, I agree with a lot of you, so they just don't agree with some of the numbers that you're showing here. Um, Go on. Our company lost billions, billions of dollars. And the vast majority of the billions were in mortgage securities privately written. Nothing to do with Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. I think if you go back and really look at the losses of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, a very small percentage of their losses were from subprime mortgages. So, I mean, I, I think by, I mean, this is an argument that I've had many, many times that everything gets around to the fair housing, but I think you are missing that Wall Street had an awful lot to do with this crisis and you seem to completely dismiss that. Well, I didn't actually. I said that, more, that the private sector had at least 24% of all of the poor quality mortgages in 2008, while the government had 76%. Now, 24% was $2 trillion, $1.9 trillion. So there, was pl there were plenty of potential losses in the private sector. Now, the losses, the actual losses of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were not as important as the fact that they drove down underwriting standards. Because when Fannie and Freddie drove down underwriting standards, others, had, in competing with them, had also to drive down their own underwriting standards. If people were able to borrow um, for a home using a subprime loan through Fannie and Freddie, then if you wanted to buy a home and you weren't, and you were buying a home that was not eligible for purchase by Fannie and Freddie, you still wanted the advantages that you got from not being required to put down a 10 or 20% down payment. And so that weakened the entire housing market. So it's not actually the losses, particularly of Fannie and Freddie, their losses and their ownership of these poor quality loans are only a demonstration of the fact that they were major players determining the underwriting standards in the market. Um, but I agree with you, the private sector had a lot to do with this. That's what Countrywide was. It was a private sector firm. It sold its mortgages to Fannie and Freddie, um, and it suffered its own losses uh, because it kept a lot of those mortgages and didn't sell them to Fannie and Freddie, and, and eventually those losses were on the books of B of A after they bought Countrywide. Yes, Peter, sir. I think we have one more question over here, oh, and then, then do where it. Where are you? Right, right back oh, okay. here. Okay, got it. Um, would you comment on the role that the ratings agencies like Standard & Poor's mm. played in this while all of these subprime, uh, these mortgage-backed securities were getting AAA ratings through this entire crisis when, you know, any, any cursory analysis would show that they were not worth what, they, what people were investing yeah. in and set, that, set up this whole crisis based on people buying on the basis of uh, ratings companies. Right. The rating agencies certainly failed. Um, and I, I, I don't have any defense of the rating agencies. I have a few facts that you might consider if you put the rating agencies into the context at the time. First, first of all, I mentioned the fact that Fannie and Freddie had not disclosed what kinds of mortgages they were buying. People in the market assumed they were still buying only prime mortgages, and yet um, about 17% of their portfolio was subprime mortgages. 
So in other words, the market was much riskier than anyone imagined at the time. Um, the rating agencies use models, and their statistical models assume that there might be losses in the future, and they plugged into those models, I assume, I've not seen the models myself or how they use them, but they probably plugged into the models the same numbers that the Federal Reserve was using as the financial crisis approached, and that is the Federal Reserve was saying, well, there are about, there are about six million subprime mortgages in the market. There were actually about 18 million subprime mortgages in the market. So the rating agencies probably were, were using the wrong data because Fannie and Freddie did not disclose that data. The second thing is that as the bubble grew, one thing was true, and that is there were very few defaults. The reason that happens is if you own a home, and you can't meet your mortgage obligation, if you've held the mortgage for a year or two, in that bubble, your house is now worth 10% more. You suddenly have equity that you didn't have at the beginning, and you are able to refinance. And that's what large numbers of people did who couldn't meet the mortgage obligations. They were able to refinance into a different kind of mortgage that didn't place so many pressures on them extended in years or reduce um, some other aspect of the, of the standard. The point was that people who were observing the market, like the rating agencies and like the regulators and like analysts and like um, uh, the, the risk managers for many, many firms, they, they looked at the market and they said, well, there aren't many defaults going on here. Maybe we were wrong about how bad subprime mortgages are. Um, we, see it, we see these mortgages being made. We don't know exactly how many, but maybe it's not as bad as we thought it was because there are so few defaults. And in addition, there was one other factor, and that is this was the dawn of the computer age. And Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and many others were using uh, automated underwriting standards. They were using computers to judge the mortgages. And there were people who were saying, you know, um, we now have skills in judging these mortgages so that they're not as risky even if people are not making the down payments that we would hope they would make because we're not seeing many defaults. All of those things came together, I think, to cause people in the rating agencies to believe that the market wasn't as risky as they thought it was. That doesn't excuse them. They should have been better about it, but we have to remember that when they judge individual companies, let's say, say IBM or Google or any number of companies, General Motors, um, they've been right most of the time, so they have the skills. They missed something when they were dealing with mortgage-backed securities, and I think it was the discrepancies in the data, uh, but we probably will never know. Good question, though. Thank you. Okay, Peter, thank you very much. Let's have a big round of applause for Peter Walson.